Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. All right, so I have a little mini sermon first. It's not even really a sermon, but I have a question for you. Does anybody feel recently like you're losing your mind? Some of you, some of you wish you could lose your mind. (laughs) I just want to, I want to make you aware of something. So I found out if you don't have a master's degree in counseling, did a lot of studying, and I wrote a book about anger, okay? And I know some of you, the word anger makes you go, so we'll use the word frustration, okay? And here's what I've found. August is a really, really, really high month for anger and frustration in our lives, in my life particularly, every August, I just find myself, first of all, it's, it's hotter than the ninth level of hell, <laughs> right? I don't even know if hell has nine levels, but it's hot. And for some of you guys that work outside, it's just really hot, okay? Uh, second of all, you've had those little munchkins with you all summer, and you're like, for the love of God, send them back to school, okay? <laughs> uh, some, like, so we've got the heat combined with the kids, combined with the just the prices. I mean, if you notice, gas is not going back down, right? It's just costs just keep going up. I, every time I go to the grocery store, I can't spend less than 50 bucks, you know? And I'm like, what happened here? So I just want to remind you of something. Here's another thing. Did you know that August is the highest month for mental health check-ins at hospitals generally? And it, it, it's because all these little cumulative things combine to create this overwhelming stress. So here's what I just want to remind you of. It's August, so if some of you are like, I'm losing my mind, which I'm right there with you. Here's another thing that happens in August. Like there's all these extra expenses you just weren't expecting. I've talked to so many people this week whose ACs went out, okay? Then you get the bill from the school and they're like, here, here's, you know, pay $37 for a parent involvement fee. And I'm like, what the, I don't even want to be involved. Why am I paying $37, <laughs> right? Like, you know, so there's all these expenses. And my point with that is, is be kind to yourself and recognize when you find yourself getting angry and frustrated and you want to explode at your spouse or whatever, there's something else going on. It's August. Okay. And uh, some of you, it's your birthday. So focus on your birthday. This month, this, this month is my daughter and my wife's birthday. So it's, yeah. But all that to say, and actually we have a birthday over here, Deanne's birthday this morning. So uh, keep that in mind because I know I've just talked to so many people and their, their, their marriages are at this, at this boiling point and their finances are at this tipping point and they're just like, what is going on? It's, it's August. And you know what? Seasons come and seasons go. And we only have four more months of this heat, y'all. We're almost there. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> that wasn't very encouraging. Sorry. <laughs> All right. There's my little mini sermon. We are going to wrap up today. The final installment in our series, Keep It Light. And uh, I have been hearing some amazing testimonies of people just saying, man, I had never thought about this applying to my life in this way. And then making some really important decisions to set themselves on a course for the future. And that's the thing about these decisions we've been talking about to make. Like once you figure out what your values are, you start to get your lo- yourself in line with God's values. But here's what I found. It takes a while to see the results of the decisions you've made. And we live in a microwave culture where we can pretty much cook anything in under 10 minutes. I've got this air fryer slash Instapot. It's incredible. I can take what should take six hours. I can take it down to about 20 minutes to cook it. And that's the world we live in. We've just gotten so used to getting everything instantly. But here's the thing about God's ways. There are no microwaves in God's kitchen. Only crock pots. (laughs) And you know, a watched pot never boils, right? And I know that every one of us in our life, if we were to talk for a few minutes, there's something in your life that you're saying this. Why is it taking so long? Like, man... I know I screwed up, but why is it taking so long to rebuild the trust in this marriage? Like I've been, I've been walking the line for years and I feel like I've been under the thumb of my spouse trying to get the trust back, but why is it taking so long? Some of you financially, you're just going, man, I have had this plan to get out of debt and every year I'm like, this is the year. And then bam, right here in August, 
Something happens, and we're not going to make this year, apart from a miracle from God, we're going to come out in the red again this year. I can already see the lines, like the, the writing on the wall. So why is it taking so long for us to get this way? Some of you, you just, with, with, you, you've got your kid doing this stuff, and you're like, I didn't raise my kid this way. Why is it taking so, so long for them to wake up? Like, I know they're going to wake up at some point, right? I believe the promise that, you know, I raise up a child in the ways to go, and when they're old, they won't depart, but he's getting really old. And he's still departed. And we all have these things in life. We're like, why is it taking so long? And I want to talk this morning about, first of all, why it's taking so long. Because, again, there are no microwaves in God's kitchen. There's only crock pots. His work is very slow. But here's what I found about his work. It's very complete and thorough. Amen. You know, I have some projects I've been working on around the house that if you look at them too closely, you'll be like, huh, that was a good enough. <laughs> you ever done any good enough projects? We're like, yeah, there's two nails. I don't want to run to the shed to get another one. Two nails will hold. Good enough. No. What's that joke? It's good enough for government work, right? Uh, <laughs> and there's a lot of things in our life that we're just like, well... I'm just, I'm tired of waiting on this project to be done, so that's good enough. Slap some paint on it, nobody will notice. But God's work is always thorough and complete. He does it all perfectly. The problem is, man, he, it takes a long time. So we've been talking about this idea that we all have something we're carrying in our backpack, and we've all got these weights that we carry around. And, and Jesus comes, he says, uh, he says, I want you, you know, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. I don't want you to have to carry all the weight of life on your own. If life is too heavy for you to carry, it's probably because you're carrying something you weren't intended to carry. So he says, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden. Take my yoke upon you. My burden is easy my, my, and light. And he says, you still got to carry a burden, but he's not asking you to carry it yourself. And so we've been talking about the, what, the, what we decide, how we decide what we're going to carry with us comes from what we value in life. And that's where Jesus says a lot of your worries are about things you value, but I'm telling you this, don't worry about what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, what you're going to wear. I mean, this could be translated, don't worry about finances, don't worry about where you're going to live, don't worry about the, what the government is doing to your retirement savings. For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. He says, I know you're worried about those things, but I'm telling you this. Seek first his kingdom, the kingdom of God, and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. And he says, and many times you don't even know what you really want in life. And have you noticed that what you want changes from season to season? So God says, I'll tell you what, if you want it all, like what's going to bring fulfillment in every season of life, value what I value, which is, we talked about that, that kingdom of God is God's order. It's how we live in harmony with the seen and unseen realities of life. It's basically valuing what God values rather than what we value. We're worried. We talked about this a few weeks ago. We're also worried about our safety and our sense of um, identity and empowerment and ability to control situations. And he's saying, look, if you'll put your primary focus to giving everything to valuing what I value, I will take care and line up all the rest of those things that you're worried about. And so we're going to talk today about the fact that it, it takes a while from the time you establish what you value and start living and getting your life in line with what God values it takes a while to see the results of it because one of the things, every one of these weeks, we've talked about somewhere where Jesus said the kingdom of God is like. He says this. He says the kingdom of God, it's in, this, is a, this is a note saying, okay, this is, this is the way to get what God values here. It says, is it as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. He sleeps and rises night and day and the seed sprouts and grows. We don't know how. Like, we still don't know exactly. We know the science that causes stuff to grow, but we're like, what causes this life force to come out of a seed? It says it sprouts, but he doesn't know how. It says the earth produces by itself first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. But when the grain is ripe, at once he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. This is what has been called the law of the farm. And this is the way God works. He works in processes. He works in seasons. And he works very systematically and thoroughly. And you can't shortcut his processes. Can you imagine if right now a farmer woke up from a drunken stupor and said, oh, snap, I forgot to plant in the spring. 
hey, but harvest time is next month. Let's plant right now. <laughs> you can't shortcut the process. You got to plant and then you wait. And it takes a while. And there's all these things about the environment that are super important to put into that. But the bottom line is this. If you plant the seed and you nurture that seed over a long period of time, eventually, because of God's processes, you're going to see a harvest. But it's a lot slower than most of us want. So I planted this earlier this year. I planted some seeds. I planted a little cucumber plant. And uh, every morning I would go dig it up to see if, if it had put roots down. <laughs> and for some reason, that cucumber plant never took off. And I was so discouraged. It's like, what's the deal with this thing? I've been checking on it every day. I mean, it's stupid. I didn't actually do that, right? I'd be an idiot. But that's what a lot of us do sometimes. We plant a seed and then we're like, okay, okay, go, 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 go. But you can't cram for a harvest. It's got to come slowly and you've got to trust the processes that got put into place. And what's really challenging is oftentimes the greatest growth happens in the dark where we can't see what's happening. And we're like, I've been doing all the right stuff, but nothing's happening. Why is this taking so long? But here, here's the thing about stuff that happens in the dark. It's the stuff that nobody gets to see that ultimately brings the results everybody wants. And, and you... You've seen this in all sorts of areas in life. It's like the people are like, how did they get there? If they've got success in their life, I guarantee you there's a backstory of discipline and hard work because there are no overnight success stories. Right. I'm just now in my life. The stuff I've been talking about, we started implementing this in our life about 12 years ago. And I'm literally just starting to see, if we wanted to put it in the biblical terms, I'm starting to see a little greenery popping up out of the ground of 12 years of living consistent with this and constantly trimming back anything that wants to get in the way, weeds that want to get in the way, and just going, nope, we got to trim it back because we got to focus on what's most important. And it's been so slow. And there have been times I'm like, man, I just, I, I'm tired of this. Like, it'd just be easier to just live for whatever you want. And, have your, and it does seem like there's this verse where King David, he says, why do the wicked get away with everything and I can't get away with anything? That's my rough translation. Anybody ever feel that way? Like people that are just like living like hell, you could say. They're like, they seem like they're getting away with everything. And I'm trying my best over here. I'm trying to stay out of debt. And they're just ringing up the credit card. I heard a thing, a stat this week, that credit card debt is the highest it's ever been in the history of the world. Did you know what's interesting is during COVID, it was the lowest it's been in many, 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 many years. All sorts of theories. Bottom line is we spend more money than we make. You look at people like that, and you're like, man, how come they can just get away with just keep, and I'm, we're trying to scrimp and save over here, and we're driving used cars, and it seems like there is, look, we've talked about this before, you got to stay focused on your journey, but listen, the results you want are going to happen in the dark, and you're not going to get a lot of credit for it while you're working on the process, okay? This is, what, this is what Paul says this, he says, no discipline seems pleasant at the time, it's actually painful, like, that's one of the things about working out at the gym. Like, after you've worked out at the gym, the next day you're sore. You don't go, what did I do wrong? I mean, you may, but most of the time you're like, oh, it's working. <laughs> the pain means it's working. Discipline means you're telling your body what it's supposed to do rather than your body telling you what it's supposed to do, okay? Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness. There's that word again that we keep seeing. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Dave Ramsey, he says it this way. He says, you've got to live like nobody else today so you can live like nobody else tomorrow. That requires strategic planning and constantly saying, what is the most important value that God has put into our lives and how do I make sure that I'm giving my best right now to what he says is most important right now? And that's what this whole series has been about. But I just want to encourage you this morning with the fact that it's going to take some time. And what it's going to take is it's going to take consistent ongoing discipline. And there are going to time, be times that it's like the roots are growing below the surface and you see no evidence above the ground. 
with your kids. You're going, man, is anything I'm saying to them sinking in? Like, I feel like I'm just talking to a wall here. You've got to trust if you're putting, and this is where the word of God is a seed like that. If you're putting that word in their heart, you can trust it's going to reap a harvest later on. So what are you planting? And we're actually, over the next few weeks, Pastor Marcus has been thinking through this. We've been talking through it for the last few weeks. There's gonna be, we're going to be doing a series about the parable of the sower. And the parable of the sower is about, it's really about the things that keep us from growing in the way we're supposed to grow. Sometimes it's environments. Sometimes it's a misunderstanding of ourselves. Sometimes it's just sin in our lives. And we're going to talk about the different things that keep us from growing over the next few weeks based on the parable of the sower. So this is kind of a setup for that next series. But... You've got to understand that everything you're planting is going to reap some sort of a harvest. So are you planting the seeds that are going to bring what you really want in the end? And that's where Jesus, God says, if you'll seek first God's kingdom and what he values and you plant those kind of seeds, I guarantee you, you'll get a harvest of righteousness and peace for those trained by it. Later down the road, but it's not going to be microwave style. It's going to be slow cooker style. And you're going to like the flavor a lot better than a microwave dinner. I guarantee it but it's going to take a while to get there. So one of the challenges I've seen with people, actually, let me me preface this. One of the challenges I've seen with a lot of people is um, they get, they start strong, but they they don't finish strong. And one of the things, I mean, I've been hanging out in the church for 45 years, and I've seen this a lot of times in people's walk with the Lord. And I have seen so many people that I was, I'll never forget, I was about, probably seven years old. My dad was a pastor of a church. He was gone one, one Wednesday, and the person he left in charge of the service had met this guy that he just thought was an amazing story. And he gave this guy a mic. The guy gets up there. He's all, you know, tattoos all out, which nothing wrong with tattoos. That was back when people didn't have, everybody didn't have them, but uh, everybody's got a tattoo now, right? I'm a freak for not having one, but he's this tough looking dude, and he gets up with a mic. He's like, I've been saved and delivered. Just last Friday, I was beating people within an inch of their life but now I'm saved and that life is gone. And I'm thinking, should we be giving that guy a mic? Like, <laughs> how do we know he's actually changed? It's only been five days, right? And maybe he's just off drugs for the first time, which is why he isn't beating people in it. Like, and I remember, I'm like a seven-year-old, and everybody's like, praise the Lord, praise Jesus. You know, and here's, here's one of the things that I'm, look, I'm a cynical little goober. I've always been that way. But I get... I don't get super excited about people coming up to me and be like, I've been radically changed. And I'm like, well, how long have you been radically changed? Well, Jesus forgave you my sins. I get that. And listen, there's this verse that says there's more rejoicing when, like, if a sheep gets lost, there's more rejoicing over the one that's, that they, we sing that song, he leaves the 99, right? That's what it's talking about. It says he'll leave the 99 sheep to go find the one that's lost. And we, it says there's rejoicing over heaven over one of these that repents. But let me tell you about that word repent. Repent doesn't just mean, oh man, I screwed up. I'm really sorry that I did that, but Jesus forgives me. Yay, yippee, it's all clear. Okay, repent actually means you're going one direction. The word is metanoia. You're going one direction and all of a sudden you go, uh, this is the wrong direction. And you start walking in the right direction. But I don't think you get credit just for turning around. The credit comes when you turn around and start walking in the direction that God called you to. And, and, and this is a mistake I see. A lot of times we, we celebrate the amazing, miraculous victories. I'm telling you, again, I don't mean to be cynical, but I've seen this over and over again. We celebrate these radical overnight changes, but I'm like, we'll see if it was a radical overnight change because change means ongoing change. One moment of, oh, I feel bad, you know, I, did, I felt bad, now I feel good about myself because Jesus washed all my sins. Come on in, boys, the water's fine. What's that movie thing? Like, right? <laughs> and I, I feel like a lot of times, and, and a lot of people, they get their identity from their radical moment, one moment of change, but they haven't changed anything since then. Right. And they go back telling their testimony of, you know, and this and that, and I'm like, no, look. If that's, your, if that's your only story of God's work in your life, you've stopped growing. Come on, and this is where this verse is so fascinating to me. Here's another one where the kingdom of heaven is like. Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, 
When a man found it, he didn't go, I found it, I found it, look, I found Jesus. No, what he did, he hid it again. And then in his joy, he went out and sold all he had. He got rid of everything he was holding on to, to go turn it all in for that one thing, that field. He bought the whole field. And I read a quote this week that I was like, this, this is the best quote I've ever heard explaining this. It's from Henry Nowen. He's a Catholic priest. And he said this, you have found a treasure, the treasure of God's love. If you expose the treasure to others without fully owning it, you might harm yourself and even lose the treasure. A newfound love needs to be nurtured in a quiet, intimate space. Overexposure kills it. You know, when God knocked Paul off of his horse, well, we assume he was knocked off his horse. Uh, it says, he says, I, I, I came to know Christ and then I ran to the desert for three years where I learned about God. And we, really, we actually believe that God actually discipled him personally. Maybe Jesus personally discipled him in the desert. And I think that's a picture of what we need to do. A lot of times what we do is we, we get this new salvation thing and we go and we run forward. I'm changed. Everything's great, right? But we haven't actually taken time to internalize what's happened. And we make a lot of noise. And I cannot tell you how many people I've, I've even seen it in the last six years here. And I don't think it's any fault of the church. I think it's just what people do. They come in, they're radical. Hey, I just pastor. Everything's changed in my life. Like everything's changed. I'm like, that's great. And then I never see them again. I'm praying they went to another church, but no, typically they washed out because they loved the joy of it, but they, they, they overexposed it. Rather than going deeper, it's trying to like, look at this, look at this tree, and the tree has no roots, and as soon as the wind comes, there goes the tree. So my point isn't this, it isn't to say, oh, don't rejoice over your salvation. I'm saying let's rejoice over your salvation, but... Let's use it not as an identity of like, hey, look, look how bad I was and look how now I've turned good, right? I want to see, can you, can you keep it? There's a, there's, a, there's a, supposedly this is true, but right after the Constitutional Congress where they got together and got the Constitution together for the United States, uh, somebody, a reporter asked one of the, the delegates, they said, so do we have a monarchy or do we have a republic? And the guy came out and he goes, we've got a republic if you can keep it. Because you don't get it, it's not a one-time decision. It's an ongoing, we've got to maintain, maintain, maintain what's been made. And I think that's a good picture of the Christian walk. And if you're new to the Christian walk, listen, I applaud you for surrendering your life to Jesus. Wisest thing you'll ever do. But let me tell you something. Now is the time to dig deep. Dig deep. Be in church any time the doors are open. Come to two services if you can, okay? Go find a Bible study to be part of. We're about to announce small groups in just a few weeks. Get into a small group because you ain't going to make it if your roots aren't deep. Right. And this is one of the powerful things. This, this next series we're about to talk about is going to talk about how to make sure you, you get those roots deep so that the winds come, you don't get knocked over. When the fire starts burning, you don't burn up. But it's going to take consistent, consistent action. There's this guy named James Prochaska. And uh, he says that change, he studied change for many, many years. And he says change happens in a very sequential process. He says this. He says it starts with pre-contemplation. Pre-contemplation is when you don't even realize there's a problem. But everybody around you does. You don't realize your values are out of order. But your spouse does, that you're spending too much time at work. Right? You don't realize that, you know, your, your money, how you, your, the way you see money is out of order, but everybody else says, man, they, he is a greedy so son of a gun, right? <laughs> you don't see it, but everybody else does. And then what happens is something happens, a tension point happens that causes contemplation where you go, maybe there's something wrong about the way I'm doing this stuff, right? Maybe it's like that argument with your spouse over money again, and you're like, maybe there's something we need to consider here. Then he says what happens is there's a preparation time where you start to go, yeah, but if I change that, that's going to require, oh, I don't want to change that. And we think through the process of what change would look like. Then he says the next step, if you, if you can get past preparation, any of these you can wash out, right, is action, where you go, all right, it's time to make the change. And you implement the change. 
Now, here's what he found. The difference between a relapse to the old behavior and actually keeping it is what he calls maintenance. And I'm convinced that most of life is maintenance. My wife does not like it when I say that. She says it sounds boring. I don't like maintenance more than, any more than the rest of, of you. But anybody can build something new and beautiful. How do you keep it looking good and beautiful? You have to maintain it. How many shopping centers have you gone to that's like, wow, that thing was like, that was the hopping place when I was a kid. And now you look at it and you're like, this place is trashed because <laughs> nobody has maintained it. It's all about the maintenance. And the difference between you relapsing to the old behavior and actually staying the course, getting out of this loop, is the ability to maintain what you've found. And that's where the, King Solomon, he says this. He says, the end of a matter is better than its beginning and patience is better than pride. That's why... I love a funeral way more than I love a wedding. But we spend all this money and time on weddings, and gosh, celebrate weddings. It's an amazing thing, two people coming together. But have you noticed that after the wedding, things go downhill? It gets hard. You're like, I thought love would keep us alive. And you're wanting to kill the person you used to love. Keeping a marriage together is hard requires maintenance. And, and here's what typically happens. Marriage gets so bad and we don't call in help until it's too late. But I want, I want you to think about it this way. If you showed up late, men, to a meeting and everybody's like, where were you at? And you're like, well, I was with my golf coach. They're like, oh, dude, that's sweet. Like, you're committed to golf. But if you show up late to a meeting and they're like, where are you at? And you're like, I was with our marriage counselor. They're like, ooh, what's wrong, bro? What if it's just going to a marriage counselor is just like going to a golf coach? It's just saying, I want to get really good at this. So I'm going to do proactive maintenance. I'm not going to wait until the plumbing is exploding. I'm going to do maintenance beforehand so we don't have that problem. Yeah. And you go, well, yeah, but going to a counselor means there's a problem. <laughs> at this point it does, but it doesn't have to mean that. I have a friend, and he's the, he's the marriage guru at this very large church. And uh, he says, I know I'm cynical, but he's like, every time a guy comes up to me, he's like, hey, are you Rick? And he's like, yeah, man, how long has she been gone? He goes, I know if somebody's coming up to introduce me, because somebody's like, oh, your wife left, you need to talk to him. Because he's like, they only come when it's too late. When everything's exploded. And the only way you're going to keep the weight of life lighter in this long journey, I, I almost called this message today, the weight of the weight weight of waiting. The only way you're going to stay long term is to recognize that, man, it's the decisions you make day in and day out, the maintenance that's going to make the difference between those who wash out early and those who make it to the end strong. And this is where the Apostle Paul says this. He says, let's not become weary in doing good for at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we don't give up. And I think so many of us, we give up right before the green starts popping out of the dirt. It's like, it's right there. But you're like, this is taking too long. I give up. And you give up just a little bit too early. And God's just about to do his most amazing work in your life. But you're tired, and I get it. And it's hot outside. And you're just sick of this. But you, and it's August. But you stay in trusting this. Listen, if you plant seeds and stick around long enough, eventually you'll get to sit in the shade of the trees you've planted. If some of you are living that with your kids right now. You're like, man, it was hard raising those goobers. But what a joy it is to have them at home. There's peace in the family. We love it, right? Some of you haven't gotten there, but listen to me. You stand on the promise. The man train up a child in the way they should go and when they're old they won't depart stand on the promise that God loves your kids more than you do stay in faith and you keep doing the right thing one day after another one of the days on the Inca Trail Pastor Marcus and I we did and uh, I've done it about 10 times since then there's this day too that everybody dreads where you start in this valley and they're like you see that saddle up there in the, between the mountains it's at 14,000 feet that's where we're crossing and you look at it and you go ain't no way Ain't no way that's going to happen. And I've always, I, I, I teach people a secret hiking tip. Everybody sees it the night before, and then we go to sleep, and then I'm like, all right, in the morning, I'm going to show you a secret hiking tip for how to get to the top of that mountain. I say, all right, put, 
everybody, everybody wants the secret hiking tip. Stand up here. And I say, stand up straight, put your shoulders back. And they're like, all right. And I'm like, they're like, what do we do? What do we do? And I'm like, all right. I want you to take your right foot and I want you to just shift it in front of your left foot. <laughs> and then take your left foot and then shift it in front of the right foot. And they're like, and, and then what? Do we pivot? I'm like, do it again. <laughs> and they're like, that's the stupidest tip ever. But when we get to the top of the mountain and they all make it, they all turn around and go, wow, it's amazing how far you can come putting one foot in front of the other consistently, doing it every time. And if you get a little tired, rest. We talked about that last week. Take a Sabbath, take a little bit of rest, but then get back in the game and keep putting one foot in front of the other and you will get to the top of the mountain. I can guarantee it because it's going to be his power empowering you. When you're getting in line with what he values, the same spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead, it says it lives in you and he will give life to your mortal body. He will take you places you could never go on your own. When he breathes in your direction, man, the force of his breath behind you can take you places you never could have dreamed. Value what he values. Do whatever it takes to get rid of anything that's holding you back from running the race that's set before you. And trust that God's going to give you the power. If, you're, if it's getting too heavy, Look around and say, God, what am I carrying that's not mine to carry? What do I need to put on your shoulders? And he will do it. And I guarantee you, you'll go way further than you could have ever imagined, exceedingly abundantly, far above all you ever ask, you ever ask or think according to his power at work in you. That's it. That's all I got. Y'all receive that? All right, let me pray for you. Father, we thank you so much that it is your power at work within us. And I thank you when we get in line with what you want for us, man, we come out looking real good. It's for your glory, for our joy and fulfillment. And I thank you, Lord, that you are working all things together for our good. So I pray for those that over this series, they've realized, man, some values are out of alignment here. This tension in my marriage, the struggles in my finances, it's some of it's just because I've been valuing the wrong stuff. And I pray that we would have the humility to, first of all, acknowledge we made the mistake. It's that moment of contemplation and waking up saying, there, there, there's a problem here. I need to take some action. And I pray that as we surrender to you, Lord, you give us wisdom in our unique situation through the Holy Spirit, how to apply what we've learned in this series to our lives because your, your yoke is easy and your burden is light. So I want us to, I pray that we would all be walking in that lightness. If you're here this morning, you've not given your life to Jesus, turned like I talked a minute ago, turned from doing it your way and doing it his way, I'm going to say a prayer in just a second. If you say this prayer and you mean it when you say, it's not a magic formula, but if you mean it in your heart, God's going to come and transfer you out of the kingdom of darkness, give you an eternal address in eternity with him. It starts by saying this prayer. Let's all say it together. Lord Jesus, we repent of our sins. We turn from our way. We turn to your way. Help us walk in your truth. Amen. Hey, if you just said that prayer, welcome to the kingdom of God. We've got some resources to help you on the journey. Let somebody know you made that decision today. You guys be blessed. Be back here next week. An amazing series coming for you. It's called Dirt. We'll see you all there. Bye-bye. If you are ever in the Seguin area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.